Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters, and key figures from the publishing industry, plus loads of hints, tips, and inspiration for all kinds of creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review, or just tell a friend. Right, cue that cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing Grab yourself a drink cause it's joined up writing Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast where a little procrastination can and usually does go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 106 with Ros Morris, author, ghostwriter and creator of the brilliant Nelia Novel. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast where a little procrastination can and often does go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 106 with Ros Morris, author, ghostwriter and creator of the brilliant Nail Your Novel series of books. Ros has got tons of advice for writers, new and experienced, and her own writing history is really interesting too. Just before that, a couple of things from me. Uh, since the last show went out, I've had another rejection. Yay! Taking me up to four so far. And, uh, you know, if there are any experienced published authors out there, I'm sure you'll be chuckling at that and saying, Four? Ha! Come back when you've got 40. And, you know, they'd be right to laugh because I know I'm only just getting started and uh, I've now fully come to terms with the fact that I just have to hunker down and settle in for the long haul. I'll keep on with my other writing projects in the meantime. I'll keep sending out the submissions and most importantly, I'll keep reminding myself that I write not because I have to, but because I really do love writing. I mentioned uh, the script project that I've been collaborating on and that's a great example of what I'm talking about because the submissions process for that is just about to begin. But regardless of what happens with it, I've just really enjoyed the process and feel like I've learned loads of new stuff about structure, character, writing comedy. Um, the latter of which I haven't really done since I, I wrote a load of sketches in my late teens. So I'd say the same to you. Don't discount the enjoyment and the personal growth you get out of create creativity and writing. It's easy to get bogged down thinking about publication and marketing and all the other stuff that comes alongside trying to build a, a writing career. But there's nothing wrong with doing any of this stuff just for the hell of it. So get the words down and smile while you're doing it. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention before the interview was another podcast recommendation, Rule of Three, which is a podcast about comedy writing. But to be honest, it's just packed with loads of great general writing advice and inspiration, regardless of what genre you write in. They're particularly good at talking about characterization and structure. Um, the format for each episode is that a guest is interviewed about their favorite comedy related artifact. So it could be a, a sitcom. Uh, a, well, or a particular episode of a sitcom, a record, a book, or even a magazine, because a recent show looked at um, Smash Hits magazine. So, um, yeah, highly recommend it, so give it a try. Right, on to today's chat with Roz Morris. So Roz is an experienced speaker, tutor, and writing coach. She's taught creative writing masterclasses for The Guardian newspaper, and she speaks at a range of writing and publishing events. In addition to writing her own novels, Memories of a Future Life and Life Form 3, Roz was a really successful ghostwriter for a number of years and went on to create the excellent Nail Your Novel series of writing books. So we recorded this chat back at the beginning of April. OK, Roz, thanks so much for joining me on Joined Up Writing. I really appreciate it. So for just to start us off, why don't you tell us how things have been going and, and whereabouts you're speaking from? Uh, I'm speaking from my desk in London in my study, which is crammed with books. In our house, we don't need any book, any um, paintings or anything like that. We just have bookshelves absolutely everywhere. Um, and I've been working on my third novel, which has been taking me a while because I've been interspersing it with other editing work. Well, your and your projects, yeah. Yes, yes. Something else comes along and I think, oh, I should do that. And then the, the book gets kind of bumped backwards. <laughs> yeah. But it means that I do have lots of 
systems and mechanisms for getting back up to speed quite quickly. One of the things that that I that I often end up helping people with because uh, I do quite a bit of consultancy. People come to me and say, "Oh, I've got stuck on my book and now I don't know how to pick it up," or I've "Got stuck on one particular thing. Oh, it all seems a big mess." And so, sort of sorting out people's minds and how they relate to the book is is something I'm very experienced of, and um, it's partly because of having to pick my book up put it down again, pick up something else. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes also because I, um, I go straight um, and so sometimes I will be picking up someone else's manuscript and then getting into that for a bit. Different headspace again, yeah. Lots of different headspaces. So um, my Nail Your Novel series, the, the first book in that, which is mainly a process book, came about because I was just quite used to doing all these multitasking bits and knowing what to do when and what kind of notes to leave myself mm -hmm. so it sort of came out of that well why don't why don't we start there you meant you mentioned now your novel there so why don't you tell us a little bit about that series of books and in particular the latest sort of companion workbook that you've released well the companion workbook is is um a an expanded version of the original book i wrote um originally in fact it's 10 years ago 2009 <laughs> uh I, I wrote a book called Nail Your Novel, Why Writers Abandon Books and How You Can Draft, Fix and Finish with Confidence. And this is because I was constantly meeting writers who needed that kind of guidance. Mm -hmm. As I said, they, they, they might have put the book down in a difficult place or had to, to stop it because of something else they were doing. Um, but also, um, I, I do a lot of critiquing and I, I would often advise an author to do a lot of restructuring on, and look at character arcs and, and sort of the big shape of the book and move things about. And they would look at me in abject horror and say, well, how do I do that? I've got yeah. 60,000 words. I can't make head or tail of it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I do this very easily and I started to break down how I did and I thought a helpful thing I could do would be to write about that and from that I ended up just writing my whole process and now 10 years on I I go to book events and I meet people and they say your book helped me write my book <laughs> which must be really rewarding it is it's lovely I, I'm sort of seeing graduates almost yeah of, of, yeah of my book growing up and so I thought um I'd seen quite a few workbooks around um, and I thought, I wonder if there's more that I could add if I made a workbook version. So I I did and uh, and it was a lot of fun and I, I sort of revisited some of the ideas, expanded them a lot um, from, you know, the 10 years worth of experiences of talking to authors, finding what they needed, finding what they found difficult. And um, yeah, so now I have a workbook version. That's brilliant. So just give us a flavour of some of that. So presumably you've added things like exercises and, and sort of processes that people can sort of work through now, have you? I have, yes. Um, and they're based on the kinds of questions that I find myself asking authors when they come to me, if they if they don't know what to do with their plot, or they've been told by someone that, that they needed a lot more plot, they don't know where to find it. So I, I'll ask a series of questions about that. Um, characters plot and characters sort of go hand in hand one gives you the other um so i i figured out ways to put those into a questionnaire form where you you just write answers to these questions and have a good deep think about all sorts of aspects of your book um i also decided to add quite a bit about method because we all have different ways in which we feel creative mm -hmm. and different things that inspire us and different ways of harnessing that so i've got sections on how you find out what suits you and they're often things that you haven't really thought about before like and at what time of day or whether it suits you to write short bursts whether word count targets help you or whether they make you panic and think oh i've just got to get any old rubbish down then mm -hmm. you disappointed with yourself there's, there's a lot of kind of mind games in in there so i decided to expand on that a lot and um tire kicking as well so where you've you've got things happening in the book that you but you haven't really thought about why and if you did think about why it would make the book a lot stronger mm -hmm. and i've also got a section on choosing your title because titles uh, just make you think about the book in a different way. Um, you know, you could call your book a number of titles, and they would all be correct in some way. But you've got to find the way that's correct for your book, and that has the right connotations, and that will attract the right kind of readers. So uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of that kind of thing. 
So loads of like really practical tips really that people can apply directly to even if they've got something that's already written or they're at the start of the process. That's that's right, yes. And um, at the end, I also have a section on um, if you're pitching it to the outside world, um, which might be traditional publishers and agents, or it might be if you're pitching it to book bloggers yourself or um, talking to um, publicists. Um, there are loads of ways in which you might have to boil down what your book is, the important things about it, and describe them to someone. And, and that's going to be your way of introducing the book. Particularly if you're if you're briefing a cover artist, for example, mm -hmm. they won't necessarily read the book, but they rely on you to pick out the important characteristics so they can do a good job of making a good cover. So all those kinds of factors, um, I've 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 got a section on how you write an effective synopsis that will actually sell your book well to anybody who needs to understand it without necessarily having time to read it, or who might need to, as a, with a literary agent, who might need to be um, enticed to read it. So you have to show them it's their kind of thing. Well, that would definitely be useful. I think I, I speak for, I would say, the majority of my listeners and every other writer that I've ever spoken to. The synopsis is probably most people's least favourite thing to do out of, the, oh. out of the whole book writing process. It's horrible. And um, the back cover blurb is even worse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the first one I wrote for one of my own books, I, I think it took me about four weeks <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of, yeah. of fiddling and, and honing because every word counts. It's mm. only a short number of words. So you have to really make every word count. But but again, you know, if you do it in, in stages, that's another thing this book is about, which stages you do everything in, what makes sense in a creative order, what when to to pull away, when to go close in. Um, it's all about you get to the end by kind of managing everything very carefully. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as I say, I mean, it sounds great and I'm looking forward to reading, catching up on the on the books that I've already missed, as I kind of mentioned to you at the, at the top of the show or just before we started recording, is I'd, it was such a long time ago that I read it that I didn't actually realise there were two more books in the series as well, besides the, um, the, the latest workbook. So definitely advise people um to give them a try because they it's just really sort of practical it's kind of not airy fairy kind of advice and it's obvious that you've it comes from things that you've kind of worked out yourself um that's kind of what comes through so so on that subject why don't you tell us a little bit about your background kind of where you grew up and your kind of earliest memories of writing well i grew up in cheshire and um i was it, it was almost a literary landscape because I, I don't know if any of your readers will, uh, listeners, I'm used to saying readers for everything. I, just read <laughs> out. Um, I don't know if anyone would know of the books by Alan Garner. He's a children's writer, right. or, still alive, still is a children's writer. One of his most famous was The Weird Stone of Brisingerman, mm -hmm. which was, uh, a, I suppose it's a fantasy involving two children who go into a, a kind of Arthurian world um, through some caves in the place where they're living. Mm -hmm. And that was actually set virtually in my backyard. Right. And the caves were um, a mixture of natural caves and copper mines. So I could go out of my back gate and be in this landscape and, um, and actually go to these places. And the places in the books were real. Mm -hmm. So that got me thinking at a very young age about the – about the imagination, the world of the imagination, how you could part some trees and look into a clearing and, and there could be something there, you might find anything. Also, I, I just loved reading, I loved stories. Um, and um, writing was just a, a natural thing to do. I was always very creative. I was always thinking, what if? And um, it's it was just a, a natural state for me to be in. And I, I never really lost the habit of making up stories. <laughs> You just followed it on from there. And did you have other careers before you kind of got into writing? When did when did you sort of seriously consider it as a as a possible career or something that you could follow in that direction? Well, I had a bit of a peculiar way around of getting into it. I I always was in kind of the literary world. Um, the first proper job I had out of university was in a publishing company. Um, it was a publishing company that was producing a set of um, 
directories of degree courses and they needed people with degrees to proofread. So I was just proofreading this stuff. And I thought, I just like editorial work. Mm -hmm. So I inveigled my way into an interview there and said, oh, consider me for for a proper job here. Mm -hmm. And they did. And I, I, so from that, I learned to make books. It was great. Yeah. Sort of from the inside out almost. Yes. And I I ended up, um, I would be, I was in charge of the editorial department within a, um, within about a, a year and a half because they had quite a fast turnover of staff. But I, I just learned all the the things you needed to know to make books on the job. So I was commissioning um, authors. I was, I was actually initiating books, deciding on the content, finding people to write them. Um, I edited a novel. I did one novel. <laughs> I, I did all the production, trained people to do production, um, learned about proofreading, copy editing, trained people to do it. So um, it ended up being an absolutely brilliant grounding mm. for, for what I later ended up doing. And then I wasn't doing that much writing of my own, but um, I met a... I met a writer and uh, reader. I married him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, sort of the, the other piece of the, of, the, of the big jigsaw just came into place because um, he, being a, a writer, a fiction writer, was always talking about stories and the way they they worked. And I just thought, I get this. I really understand this. Yeah. It was just something that made real sense to me. The the, the way that characters worked and story structure. It, it was it was just like a light came on. Mm-hmm. So I started trying to write, and I was suddenly surrounded by a lot of people for whom writing was completely normal. Yeah. Um, it was, I suppose, what people get when they go into a creative writing course. Mm-hmm. So they'll suddenly be among people who are doing a lot of this, and they talk about it a lot. Yeah. And I, I suddenly suddenly had this this group and we were all we were talking about writing works in progress books we were working on and it I, it just fitted naturally um, so I started trying to write short stories of my own I then started writing a novel of my own I queried various agents and I was told um, you've got very unusual ideas but you write really well mm-hmm. uh, which was nice but um, also wasn't the progress I hoped for sure yeah it didn't give you the help you needed yeah. <laughs> Um, but then um, my husband was doing some ghostwriting for a series. Um, the, the publishers suddenly said they wanted him to change the book uh, because what had happened was they'd commissioned a series of 12 books that were all supposed to look like they were written by one author. Mm-hmm. But to get them done fast enough, they got 12 different authors. Right. So what they ended up with was 12 wildly different books <laughs> that couldn't possibly have come from one author. Right. So then they started trying to get everyone to mend their books to fit the new shape. Smooth it over, yeah. Mm. So um, he didn't actually have time to do a new book because he was onto his next contract. But he said to me, I know you could do this, just follow their instructions. So um, I just invented a completely new plot because that's what it needed. Mm -hmm. Wrote the book, handed it in. They said, oh, you've saved our bacon, this is wonderful. At which point we were able to say, it wasn't by me, it was by Roz. (laughs) Roz, she can do this. So I, I got in by the back door so you were sort of ghosting a ghostwriter ghosting a ghostwriter (laughs) and yes uh, but all people need all publishers needed was someone who could do the job they wanted of course and um and i proved i could so then i started getting asked to do other bits and pieces um and meanwhile i was sort of trying to find a voice of my own figure out what i wanted to do myself and i ghost wrote quite a few novels um i sold a shocking amount of copies which i didn't realize until many years later mm-hmm. um and um, i then thought right i've really got to try and and make a go of my own writing and uh, that's what i did so yes it was <laughs> that, that was a very long explanation but that that's how i eventually ended up finding my own voice discovering what i wanted to write having tried on a lot of other people's mm. ways of telling stories and their voices and their worlds, I kind of arrived at my own. Did that make it quite difficult, though, presumably, with the ghostwriting thing? I mean, presumably it was, as you say, it was great experience. But did you find it difficult from a point of view of you had all these different hats that you were having to wear and all these different voices that you were having to write in? Or was that something that you kind of found fairly easy to begin with? Well, book projects are quite 
big and full on so you can only really do one at a time mm -hmm. so i just get into that book and do it and then go on to the next one i remember i finished <laughs> finished one in the, um, the morning and started another in the afternoon <laughs> <laughs> and one had been set in a um a place where there was flooding and the one i started in the afternoon was an arid desert so <laughs> a bit of it a was gear proper, change. yeah yeah proper gear change it almost sort of harks back to like the days of like pulp fiction writers you know that were sort of churning out dozens and dozens of books to the yes. to a market i really admired them for what they could do and they 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 even had a really pared down style as well if you look, yeah. look at them, they're just absolutely slick and fast and the sentences really move as well they've got a real pulse yeah, to them but yeah. they obviously just it was tumbling straight out of their heads yeah they, it's they like 100 really percent story yeah yeah mm. they just uh, off you go um but it's, so so presumably with that you you learned a lot so from the ghostwriting point of view because it is one of those things by its very nature because it's kind of quite secretive i suppose and it's as you say the idea is that you kind of don't exist at all intents and purposes a lot of the time so kind of how does the process work so once you'd got your name out there as a ghostwriter or you were kind of or you the people that know that you're a safe pair of hands and you can do this so how would it work when somebody approaches you with a project everything's different every every, every time um, every time um you know sometimes you'll brought a manuscript that the, the, the you call them the the author because their name is going to go on the cover or that your name might go on it or you, you might never ever be known yeah. most of the ones i did I, nobody ever knew i yeah. was involved um but yeah they might have had to go to manuscript themselves or you might meet them and and tease something out of them and work on something together sometimes they don't really want to have much to do with it at all and you liaise mostly with the publisher because mm -hmm. the publishers usually got an idea of what they Wall want sell, yeah yeah because they're, they're really hiring you because they know they can sell it, so they've they've got a, a firm idea of the market um, from the word go. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it's it's different. It's different every time, and um, it's it is really interesting, a really interesting discipline. Um, because you you've got to kind of you let go of your ego. You just write on behalf of them. Yeah, completely. I suppose in in a way, it's kind of an extension of what you might do. If you're writing a novel in, say, first person, your own novel, and it's in first person or, or close third person or whatever, you know, you kind of used to this idea of adopting or jumping into the headspace of a character at any one given time. And I suppose to a certain extent, you're kind of doing that across a whole book. But you know, you're slipping into the uh, the persona of this other person, this other author that you're writing it for. I suppose is it. That's right. Yes, and um, you you write the book. They would write it if they could. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> that is a great way of putting it. And did you did you ever get much feedback actually from the authors and in inverted commas at all, or did was it a case that you weren't you you know oftentimes you weren't sort of even in the you know you didn't get to meet them or whatever. <sighs> I did get to meet them, and um, I got on really well with them. I I always liked them just as people, and that's an important thing. You have to, um, but you have to write from a genuine place mm -hmm. of so wanting to do a good job for them yeah. because you like them. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you can connect, and um, especially if you're doing um, autobiographies or memoirs, um, you've got to to write from a place where y you know you feel it's it's good to be them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I mean, some people say, "Oh, well, I couldn't work with such and such a person." Well, if if you think that, then you can't. Yeah, yeah. You kind of got to got to be open minded, and you've got to go with the process. Mm. And I had I also had really good relationships with the people I go through it for, and they really liked what I did. Um, and in fact, there's there's one who I go through it for, and um, I know that they used quite a lot of ghostwriters. This person, mm -hmm. but I think I did more books for for them than anyone else did for them if that makes sense yeah it does yeah yeah well that that speaks for itself and just the amount of projects that you did so how do you think the ghost writing uh thing that you went through how do you think it influenced your own writing process what did you learn from it would you say oh huge amounts um i had very rigorous editors um uh, up until then i'd i'd been editing i'd been on the editorial side so i had been doing the work on people's manuscripts i would get books in i would 
uh, do the developmental editing, copy edi- editing, and all that. But when you're an author and you see it from the other side, you, you really learn what they find, what the publisher finds troublesome, and w- how they worry about the market. It's a it was a really really good education, and I had such. Um, fussy editors and yeah. they made me absolutely meticulous about my research I had to be able to justify absolutely every fact mm-hmm. I put in um, and it, it just really made me pull my socks up yeah that's great and and like with regards so you mentioned there obviously they're quite by the nature of it they're, they're selling books at the end of the day so they are kind of governed by the market what whether did you tend to see the same sorts of things you know working with different publishers did you see the same sorts of things kind of come up time after time where there were there certain things that they wanted you to focus on more than others oh yes they, they always had an idea of the market they usually had comparison titles they were chasing mm-hmm. uh, so it's very very commercial and very genre based so it'd be like, well, we need it to be a little bit more in the ballpark of X book or Y book or whatever, or so and so and so's a certain author, maybe would it be? Yes, yes. You'd be given an author, and you and you go away and read them, and that's who they wanted you to be like. Sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so, so how did you kind of move on from that? So moving on to to when you started writing your own fiction, sort of seriously, what was the first kind of project? That well, what was the first novel that you finished? Because a lot of people start lots of novels, as you probably may or may not have found when you started doing long form writing before you wrote now your novel and everything else. Did you find that it took you a while before you got to one that you actually finished? And what was the difference with that project? Well, that's a really good question because the novel that I finished, my first novel as me, I started before I did any ghostwriting. It was an idea I loved. And it's my memories of a future life, yeah. uh, which I, I did eventually publish and, and it got me an agent. But I, it was a real kind of grueling training wheels kind of book, because to start with, my idea was far too complicated for me to know what to do with it. But I yeah. just knew I had to write it. So I went through absolutely loads of drafts, loads of learning curves. Um, in the meantime, I... I then did all the ghost writing, so I, I suddenly got far more snappy about understanding how to put a book, how to put a story together. Yeah. Um, but I still wanted the real kind of much more thoughtful literary quality because that's what I enjoyed reading. Yeah. Um, I also I I got a literary agent for it who um, and, and we went through it together and I did a rewrite that that she liked, but I still wasn't happy with that. Um, and I eventually, after I, I, I sort of got my various ghost writing projects um, finished, and, and I thought I'm going to really have a go at this book and do it properly, and I started started editing editing it again for for the umpteenth time. I'd also been doing a lot of consultancy as well. I'd been doing a lot of mentoring mm-hmm. for. Uh, one of the literary consultancies in London. So I'd seen a huge number of authors' manuscripts, learned an enormous amount from what I could see they were trying to do and what was actually coming across. So I'd helped a lot of people get their novels the way they wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. And I had all this that I could suddenly bring back to my book. And that's when it really clicked. I sort of, it's like I realised who I was. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And having, having been you know, a ghost and therefore lots of different voices, lots of different souls, um, and helping other people with their books that were in the state that was part muddle and part brilliant. Mm-hmm. I saw the way to to finally do my book. And um, I, I published it and I thought, I don't know what people are going to make of this. I just hope they'll like it. And um uh, I got I got readers coming back to me and saying, "Oh, that was really haunting. That was wonderful. That was um, your language is quite poetic," which I wasn't consciously trying to be. All I was trying to do was write in a way that conveyed the atmosphere that I wanted. I, I wanted a quite a haunted, questioning, yearning kind of atmosphere. That's what I wanted to do with the idea because I, I felt it was such a haunting idea. And then people came back to me and told me what I'd written, and so. My first readers my, and reviewers particularly could have told me where I fitted. Yeah, yeah. That's usually the way, though, isn't it? It's a bit, it's almost like chicken and egg. It's always, you know, 
that thing where they say when you first start thinking about a book I've seen people ask this kind of question on Twitter and stuff new writers particularly they'll say they start worrying about where their book might fit on the shelf or where it might be sold before they've even written it and I always think well just write it first (laughs) find out what the story is what your voice is what the book is find out for yourself before you then decide about where it might fit on a shelf or whatever What, what, what do you think that's fair to say or do you think it should work the other way around I think that's really good advice. Um, And often you think you might be one thing and then you're not. Mm -hmm. And you only find out when you, you know, something just, often what you find is you'll be writing a bit and you'll be unhappy with it. And it's only when you step back and think, oh, I'll just try a different way of doing it. And you suddenly think, well, that's the direction my book needs. You know, in my soul, that's right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I do have sections in my workbook about discovering that kind of thing um and asking yourself questions and trying things and and also considering what books have inspired you because i realized i was very inspired by um by novels like the secret history where mm-hmm. you had people that donna tarts the secret history you had people together in an extraordinary situation and the the interplay between the characters and the way they make each other feel the way they make each other uncomfortable that was all really important to me and i found i was i was putting that in that those values in my book and so i thought okay so that's that's a kind of thing i i realize i'm influenced by and i and i like and if you ask yourself these questions who, who are you influenced by what um what is what did you really enjoy about it and mm-hmm. that can help you figure out who you are it takes a while to figure out who you should be definitely and i mean i think i can't remember who said it it might have been neil gaiman but it could have been equally been anybody else i'm not sure but this idea that the first draft is really you telling the story to yourself for the first time you know it's kind of you deciding what that story is and then regardless of whether you're you're a plotter or you're a pantser or whatever it is i think even if you plot a novel i think by the time you actually get to the end of the first draft is kind of when you really find out what the story is what the real themes of the book are and what it's really about yes or it might not even be until you put it away and pick it up again and mm. you suddenly see something that you realize you're aiming for it it often takes a long time for us to figure out our own minds i think yeah well it's a huge you know apart from anything else a novel even a, a short one is sort of 70 80 000 words and that's a lot that's a big project that's a lot of story that's a lot of time and it's very very difficult to keep it all in your head in one at one time anyway and as you say it's often that that period of reflection especially when you've got your head in a book and you're writing it it's kind of constantly grinding away in the back of your mind isn't it it is yes and there's a lot of time that you spend on it that isn't time at the keyboard or at the dictation app or however it is that you mm-hmm. like to get the words down. Um, you know, you take it out with you when you go for a walk or when you when you commute to work. Um, the, all these times are sort of the times when the novel's living with you. Definitely. And you kind of are knotting all those problems. So. Obviously, you've spent lots of time, you say, as you say, mentoring people and you've got books that you, you are, you're kind of giving people direction and help and everything else and, and structure. So what are, as a, as a kind of tutor, what are some of the most common mistakes or misconceptions that you see new writers making? They're often in a hell of a rush and it can take, as I said, it can take a long time to figure out what you should be. They... Um, now they often try and self-publish too quickly. Um, and I've got to, I really understand that sense of impatience of you wanting to get out, wanting to get started, wanting to get books out. But um, the trouble is you can only have a, one time to create a first impression. Mm-hmm. And although you can put a book up on Amazon really easily and then change it if there are things about it you don't like um, or if, if there are mistakes that you notice, people will have noticed them. So the thing to do is find people who are like you want to be mm-hmm. and um try and try and get involved in, in a group maybe a facebook group where there are people who do similar kinds of things to you get loads of feedback don't be in a hurry to get something out treat it like something you're really going to keep un- under wraps until you've got it perfect because if you've got a good idea that you really want to write it's absolutely worth doing it justice mm-hmm. so don't rush 
that um, it will you you will still be able to get it out there in a year's time, maybe two years time, and and maybe you'll realise that there was loads more you needed to do to do justice to the idea. Now I was an extreme example because with my memories of a future life, I had an idea that I I kept wanting to get right but mm-hmm. i couldn't um, i was never satisfied with it mm-hmm. i was sending it off to agents and they were writing back saying well you know this is awfully good and i was thinking ah, it's <laughs> not quite right is it um and if self-publishing had been available then i probably would have put it out too early um and thank goodness it wasn't but i realized the value of wise feedback um and um feedback from people who are the right kind of target as well. Because I went through a phase with that book where um, because of the, um, I'd been ghostwriting thrillers. So thriller publishers were really interested in me mm-hmm. and um, and agents who agented that kind of work were really interested in me. So when I said I'd got a novel, they just fell on me. I was getting queries from them. Mm-hmm. Like for a yeah. while, I thought, this is amazing, I'm made. And <laughs> what happened was they read my manuscript and said, oh, can't this you make it feel like... <laughs> yes, that's what they wanted. Um, you know, the, there are absolutely loads of ways you can push a story, and the wrong feedback can push you in a direction that you actually don't want to go in. So find feedback that is actually good for what you want to do and again you'll know what you want to do by the kinds of things you enjoy reading that's really good advice yeah definitely i think you're right i think especially with uh, independent publishing and stuff now there is that tendency to just you know press publish but i think i mean i've had this conversation with other indie authors and stuff on the podcast as well um i think there is a real difference isn't there between self-publishing and kind of independent publishing thinking about it more about as a getting a team of people whether that's a an editor that's going to look over your work or or whether it's going to be a copy editor or whatever it is but thinking that it is because when you traditionally publish it's it's not just you obviously you write the book but there's this whole team of people um that is you know in theory anyway trying to make your book as good as it can possibly be that is such a good point and Often I've spoken at editing conferences and self-publishing conferences, and what I've done is explain what is done to a book when it's received at the publishers. Because unless you know this, it's quite easy to think that all that happens is an author pushes their book through the letterbox Mm. of the publisher, and a book comes out. And and what they don't know, all the, the huge amounts of checking that goes on and and honing and polishing there's there's an enormous amount and a lot of it can only be done by professionals um, because you don't get that polish otherwise and it really shows when you have the polish because you you get a book that that really will stand up to scrutiny but you know i i am at at the professional end so uh, these values are very important to me the other forms of self-publishing where people might just want to get their book out for a small number of friends who will enjoy it or their family. Mm-hmm. Um, and that also has value. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The same as, uh, uh, you know, it's in the spirit of the rest of the internet in terms of, you know, a blog or anything else. It's like you want to speak to the world and you want a bigger audience and you're free to, you know, publish your thoughts or whatever. But yeah, uh, in terms of thinking whether you're then going to be able to have commercial success and, and whatever on the back of it, I think, it, I think people sometimes do underestimate the power of the the fact that it does need to be professional it does need to be slick and you do need to approach it as a, a, a i appreciate that it's a smaller endeavor and you've probably got less investment than a big publishing house but you still need to approach it in the same way and think about because as you say they wouldn't do all those things unless they made a difference because all of those things cost money so the the, the more of those things they could knock off and not do in a big publishing house they wouldn't do them so the, you know they are kind of doing what they see as the bare minimum to make it um, as good as it possibly can be. That's absolutely yeah, absolutely right. They would not spend the time and the money unless it was worthwhile. Um, and it's it's just that there are things that readers don't notice until they're wrong. Yeah, completely. I mean, it's it's a bit like the adage, you know, good writing is writing that's kind of invisible. You shouldn't notice it's good writing necessarily. It should just carry you through. The it should connect you as fully as possible with the story and the world that you're creating. And if you start to really, really notice the writing, then maybe it's a bit too much. Yes, that's so good. Yes, I'm so glad you said that. Because 
good writing seems invisible. I think you just fall into it. Yeah, and I think that's why, especially for new writers probably, or people even just considering getting into writing, I think that can be the danger. As with, I think, as with anything, I think with, with the same with the musicians or anything else, because when someone's really, really good at something or they've been doing it for a long period of time and they've put, you know, the 10,000 hours or whatever it is into it, they can make it look very, very easy and very, very straightforward. And it just appears that it's almost effortless. And obviously that's the trick, isn't it? Oh, yes. Who was it who said easy reading is hard writing? Well, that's it. I don't know, but that's a great, that is a great quote. And it's very, very true. It's very, very true. Um, well, that's, that, that's all really, really, really great stuff. So in terms of, um, you mentioned kind of at the top of the show, you kind of alluded to this, you know, you, you've, you've obviously got your two, uh, novels out. You've got, uh, my memories of a future life and the follow up, which I think is life form three, is it? Um, That's right. Yes. And you're working on another follow up now in amongst all these other projects that you're doing, the nonfiction stuff and the teaching and the mentoring and everything else. So do you find it hard to, to spend the time on your own fiction now that you've got all these different balls in the air and, um, you know, how do you find the energy in the headspace to switch between all these different genres and projects? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I always feel when I'm working on something that isn't my book, I've got a, got a little sort of bit of agitation yeah. where I'm thinking, I, I want to get back to it. It's stealing me from my book. <laughs> um, and when I finally clear something, I think, ah, at last, I open the file and it's gobbledygook. So I have to try and get back into it. Um, but um, I I kind of keep worrying at the book that I'm writing all the time. I've all, I sort of have it kind of with me in my head, and I I make music playlists. That really helps, mm-hmm. so that I can I can just go for a run and take an idea with me, and and it will just put me in the right mood to solve a problem or just to tune in with a character again things like that I have ways of of keeping it with me um and eventually I get to the the point where the the book is just an absolute obsession so I'll be getting up before the my alarm goes off to be able to come and spend a bit more time with it yeah yeah (laughs) it becomes you know just just something I cannot leave alone but then I reach a point where because people often ask me well how do you know to stop editing Mm -hmm. and I know to stop editing when I can read the entire thing through and not mind any of it that's yeah yeah that's that's a good benchmark I know I know what you mean with that as well where you haven't got that kind of nagging thing going off in the back of your head questioning everything Yes, and I, I discovered with uh, my memories of a future life again. Again, you know, it was such a training book for me. Um, I discovered that if I had a little niggle about something, it, it meant I really should go and pay attention to it. And that sense, a real, it's often quite a subtle thing, but that sense is telling you it's not quite done yet. But um, there comes a point when it is. Yeah, you have to be prepared, or at least, I mean, it's you know the the old adage is. Um... No, it's never finished. It's just abandoned. There is an element of that, I think, at some t- at a time. And that's why deadlines are good, aren't they? Oh, de- yeah, deadlines. Um, otherwise, you could fiddle forever. And certainly I've, I've had to hand books in on deadlines because the publisher is waiting. Um, and, and, and actually, when you hand a manuscript in, that's still quite an early stage. You're going to be dragged back through it again and again by the various editors yeah, and yeah. I go at it. Yeah. I think that's uh, so, I think that's a good point as well because as you say you need to get it into a position uh, into a good enough shape that it can go to that next level but you do have to be prepared that you're going to be changing it lots more <laughs> in the future anyway so there's no point being too precious. Yes, but the more you know what you're doing, the more you can get it to a finished state. Um, but this comes after a lot of experience of working with the outside professionals so you know I know what a copy editor will flag Mm -hmm. and so I just know to go and sort those problems out before they actually cause problems for me later just do the work yeah yeah that's that's a great way of looking at it so as we kind of move towards uh, sort of wrapping up what would you say is the most helpful piece of creative or inspirational advice you've been given or or, and or the least helpful during your uh, career oh oh 
that is interesting. You can do um, both or either. It's up to you. <laughs> well, I think that people change a lot uh, because the kinds of themes I I was interested in writing about when I started aren't the kinds of things I'd write about now just because I'm a much older person. Um, and this um, this is artistic and personal growth, and you're all you're going to find um, that you change over the years. You might find that a book you couldn't write, it's like me again, mm. but a book you couldn't write to start with, you eventually acquire the experience and perspective to be able to do justice to. Yeah. So I'd say um, don't ever abandon anything. Just just let it lie quiet if, you, if you're really fond of the idea. Um, and that, that's what I found. Um, and something that, that, I, that I found that was advice given to me was – never be afraid of trying something new so this is how i came to write my travel memoir not quite lost mm -hmm. and um i was i was on holiday with dave my husband and i i keep diaries of all sorts of things i got a travel diary so every time we went anywhere the travel diary always lived in the suitcase and it had all kind of odd things odd things that had happened to us and mm -hmm. so i i take it out of the suitcase on the first night, put it on the desk of wherever we were staying. And sometimes I'd look through it and say, oh, look, here's the time when the car window got stuck down. We nearly froze to death. And <laughs> I did this. And he said, you should make those into a book. And I said, yeah, they're all going in novels someday. Yeah. And he said, no, write it as, as it a is. book yeah, of his yeah. own. And I said, but I don't do that. Yeah. But I gradually started to like the idea. And and from that came a book I'm really fond of. And it was because I, I tried something new. So um, if somebody says, says to you, why don't you write a such and such book? Take them seriously. Give it a go. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Give it a go. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So so what's up next for you? And uh, tell, us, tell us where we can find you and your books online. Well, I will mention that because we've been talking about ghostwriting quite a lot, I do actually have a course, mm. a professional course. So, yeah. you, you know, you can sort of really find out how to do it. Um, mm. And you'll find that on my uh, blog, which is nailornovel.com. If you look for, there's a tab courses, so you mm -hmm. can find it there. Yeah. Um, and you can find me. Probably the easiest thing is if you look for my website, which is, rosmorris.wordpress.com and I'm R-O-Z and then Morris like Morris dancing <laughs> or Morris Minor indeed it could be Morris Minor yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on Twitter as well aren't you what, what are you on Twitter on Twitter I am Ros underline Morris because there was another Ros Morris who got the name faster than I did somebody beat you to it yeah so don't try and tweet me and look for the picture <laughs> of the red hair the red yeah, head is look, me. look for the red hair and they'll know they're in the right place that's brilliant okay well thanks so much Ros really appreciate your time it's been really great to uh, chat thanks for coming on Joined Up Writing and thank you for having me Wayne Okay, thanks again to Roz, and I really recommend her Nail Your Novel books. They're full of practical advice. Uh, and I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That pretty much wraps things up for another week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website or sign up uh, by email to get some free downloads and early access to bonus content. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube or wherever else you want to grab your podcast to have the show downloaded automatically every time an episode comes out. Also, remember to get in touch with all your writing news, views, questions or comments and you can tweet me with where you're listening or why you listen to the show and I'll give you a mention in a future programme. Look out for the next episode when I'll be chatting to the lovely Nikki Mackay about her Madison Atterley crime series. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading and I'll see you next time. Right.